My name is Michael Lee. I'm an economist at the New York Fed, and I'm excited to be moderating this next session on fintech market design. So we have uh, two stimulating papers, and uh, as a reminder, we'll have uh, presenters uh, take 20 minutes each, um, each paper followed right away by the discussant for each paper. Uh, discussants will have 12 minutes, and then we'll end the session with uh, 10 minutes open to the public for Q&A. So uh, just as with the previous sessions, uh, all the audio lines are in listen-only <laughs> mode. So if you have any questions, please submit them through uh, throughout the session via the Q&A panel, or you can also raise your, uh, use your raise your hand feature, which is found by your name. Uh, the questions uh, will be answered either directly in the Q&A panel or during the Q&A portion of the session or in follow-up communications. So the first paper is the effect of secondary market existence on primary market liquidity, theory and evidence from a national experiment in P2P lending. June, you have the floor. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you, Asani, for including our paper in the program. Uh, could you please switch the slide? Yes, please. Thank you. So we're looking at a classic question, which is how does the secondary market affect the primary market. Actually, we're looking at some extreme event, uh, which is the closure of the secondary market. So we are using a unique context, which is the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, lending market. So here, we said we're looking at one nature experiment. Actually, we just had the second one last month. So if I have time, I'm going to show a little bit preliminary results. So this is a joint work with Craig, Mingfeng, Kai, Zaiyan. Uh, so we cover finance and information technology from four different institutions. So the background is peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, platforms that match borrowers with lenders and issue unsecured consumer loans. This market has been growing rapidly uh, from 2015 to 2019, essentially it's more than doubled in terms of market share in the personal lending space. And the two big players there our Prosper and Lending Club. Uh, as of the fourth quarter of 2019, Lending Club has originated $50 billion loans. Prosper is about one third of that size. So these two platforms resemble each other very closely in borrower, lender, and loan characteristics. And here is the main event we're looking at. Uh, originally, both platforms also offered a second market, it's called Folio FN. So the holders of the notes, those are the investors in the primary market, could sell off their debt before the maturity. Uh, they pay a fixed fee of 1%. On September 29th, 2016, Prosper announced that it would close the second market. And a month later, uh, Prosper indeed shut down the second market. By contrast, our original saying was Lending Club secondary market remains open till the present, but actually uh, secondary market of Lending Club was shut down on August 26, 2020. So our uh, main results are based on Prosper's closure of its, primary, uh, of its secondary market. So our research question is a very simple one. Uh, how does the existence of the secondary market affect primary market liquidity? Uh, or if you flip it, our context is really how does the disappearance of the secondary market affect the primary market liquidity? So the main event is prosperous closure of a secondary market. At the same time, we're able to say a little bit more than that because Prosper and Lending Club, they are the biggest competitors in that space. So we can study the spillover effect on the primary market liquidity on, a primer, uh, on the prime competitor, which is Lending Club. So our research uh, is informative, not only for the peer-to-peer -peer lending space, it's relevant for all asset classes, for example, stock and bonds. Um, it's, it's unique in the sense that uh, there are many issues within a day. Say, if you're looking at uh, credit rating and term combination, we have three-year uh, term and five-year term, we have high, medium, and low credit ratings, there are many issues within each uh, class. So there are many issues that allows us to study all three measures of liquidity, which is funding time, uh, bid ask spread, that's, uh, that's the funding cost, and uh, issuance. Thank 
keep going to the different place. We have a very stylized model uh, looking at uh, how does the primary market liquidity is affected by the presence of the secondary market. So essentially we build a model with the secondary market and another model without secondary market. Uh, we predict that with the closure of the secondary market, uh, the effective spread is going to go up and um, the issuance is going to go down. Uh, we are trying uh, to extend the model right now to incorporate the funding time prediction. So essentially, if you allow uh, joining the market early to buy the nodes or join the market later to buy the nodes, we can predict that uh, with the second market, investors are more willing to buy the nodes earlier. So that's the part is still work in progress. We don't have that in the paper yet. For empirical evidence, we find um, several aspects. We have a lot more data than Prosper than Lending Club. So for Prosper, we have both uh, loans funded by individual lenders and loans funded by institutional lenders. We have not only funding time, we also have the origination fee and the percentage of listings funded. For Lending Club, we only have funding time by uh, individual investors because we crawl the platform of Lending Club. We cannot crack in their uh, institutional loans uh, platform. So we do have individual loans uh, platform. So across all these different categories, we find that a longer funding time for individual loans on Prosper after its closure of secondary market. Uh, similarly, a longer funding time for loans of uh, institutional lenders. We find a higher origination fee, especially for the low credit rating loans. We find a, a lower percentage of loan listings are funded. If I flip it, we have a higher percentage, which is a positive percentage of loan unfunded on Prosper, both by individual uh, lenders and institutional lenders. For Lending Club, we have only one dimension, that's all the available data for us, and that's the funding time by individual investors. We find a shorter time of funding for loans uh, by individual lenders. So all this evidence uh, is pointing to the same direction, which is the closure of the secondary market of Prosper uh, decrease, decreases its liquidity along three dimensions, and the uh, competitor lending club seems to benefit from the closure of Prosper's uh, secondary market. Uh, really quickly on, on, on the literature, liquidity is not new uh, for the literature. There are research both on the stock and bond market looking at how does the secondary market liquidity affect primary market price and issuance. But no one has looked at all three dimensions, uh, which is uh, funding time, uh, uh, the price, which, which is funding cost origination fee, and the issuance uh, quantity. So we're the very first one to look into all three uh, dimensions. For the model, I'm going to go really brief without introducing much detail. So essentially, we have two versions of the model, one with the secondary market, one without the secondary market. We're comparing the predictions of these two versions. Uh, the predictions are pretty straightforward. So essentially what we're saying is, if there is a secondary market, then the buyers of these nodes, they would have an exit option, right? So because there, uh, there are other uh, buyers in the secondary market can buy their nodes later on. So if they have liquidity shock, they can unload their holdings uh, on time. So therefore, they are more willing to bear the risk. The entire system can bear more risk. So this is about uh, their price premium or uh, the issuance costs that they're willing to pay. The second one is uh, because they can unload their holdings. It's very similar a spirit uh, if there's any liquidity shock later on. So they are more willing to buy in greater quantity. Uh, the last part in terms of funding time, that's the part we're still working on uh, in terms of modeling. So a little bit more institutional details. This is mostly about Prosper Lending Clubs, very similar. It's just three times as large. FICO score above 640, that's lower bound, average 710. Two terms, three years uh, or five years. This is pretty long term. And the amount is 2,000 through 40,000, usually around $10,000. Uh, the APR is 6% through 36% including the origination fees. Uh, so origination fees are deducted upfront. So this part goes to the platform. We have loan level data extracted from Prosper. 
again, for Prosper, we have a lot more comprehensive data. For Lending Club, we have the uh, loans funded by uh, individual investors. So here's the timeline. On September 29th, uh, Prosper announced the closure of second market. October 28th is the first day that the second market is not in operations uh, anymore. So we're looking at one week before the announcement and three weeks after the shutdown of the second market in terms of liquidity measures in the primary market. We're pretty conservative because this is a time we're not aware of such possibility yet. This is a time when the secondary market uh, liquidity goes down to zero. So if we alternatively use uh, October 28th and one week before that as the pre-event, our results are actually stronger. So essentially we're looking at the three measures of primary market liquidity of the three, each of the three weeks after the closure with the one week uh, prior to announcement. So it's a little bit small. Funding time is from the time a loan is listed till the time 100% of the loan is funded. So that's our main measure. Uh, origination fee essentially is how much the borrower pays uh, minus how much the lender actually receives. So if the borrower pays 24%, the lenders only receive 20%. Origination fee is going to be 4%. So here is only su summer statistics. Um, if I show you uh, the full sample, so essentially, if you only look at this, all right, I cannot really highlight this. Uh, Pre-week for individual loans, it takes about 60 hours to fund it. Uh, Post-week one goes up to 80 uh, some hours. Post-week two goes up to 92 hours. Post-week three goes up to 105 hours. So that's the pattern that carries through both three-year loans and five-year loans. And if you look at the categories of top grade, middle grade and bottom grade, that's pretty much the case everywhere, except for high uh, top grade loans in the very first week. So for top grade loans in the very first week, the time goes down uh, a little bit. That's probably due to flight to safety within the same uh, platform. In other places, we see substantial increase in funding time. So if I show you something more straightforward, so this is, uh, the funding time for Prosper and Lending Club over time, Prosper is the solid line and Lending Club is the dash line. So the first horizontal line is announcement date. Before that, they mimic each other closely. We don't have the data going far beyond for uh, Lending Clubs. That's essentially why we can only look at one week before that. And the effective date is right here. So they mimic each other really well uh, prior to announcement. And then you see the divergence. The funding time goes up substantially. For Prosper and Lending Club, uh, you see it's not going up, and uh, in some categories, it goes down uh, substantially. So this is uh, looking at the change in funding time. So for example, if like the full sample, post week one minus prior week. So this is you see uh, for uh, Prosper individual loans, funding time increased by almost 28 hours. And post week two, it increased by 32 hours. Post week three increases by uh, 46 hours. This is the same case at the median uh, by a larger amount even. And you see very much consistent pattern except for three year top grade loans. And we do this uh, for lending club individual lenders as well. Remember this is competitor. We see essentially the reverse pattern. A lending club for the entire sample you see a reduction in funding time substantially, both at the mean and the median for post week one, post week two, and post week three relative to the uh, pre week. And that's also the case for prosperous instit institutional lenders. For Lending Club, we don't have institutional lenders. For Prosper, we do. So you see, for the entire sample, funding time goes up substantially. So we can do this in a regression setting, controlling for borrower characteristics, uh, borrower state six pack and other loan characteristics. Uh, the, the, the pattern is very much similar, even though it's not uniform anymore. So overall, we see a substantial increase in prosper loan funding time and substantial decrease in lending club loans uh, funding time. So this is the second group of results, which is origination fee. Uh, this is what the platform charges 
overall, we see an increase in origination fee for prosperous individual uh, lenders. We don't have the data for lending club, and mostly comes from the low quality loans. Uh, these are the worst quality. The second market is more active for these uh, for these low quality loans, and also holding a low quality loan for three years is something sub, uh, imposed substantial risk for many borrowers, uh, investors in this market. So we see substantial results here. Economically, this is not as large. Um, this is very similar results for institutional lenders. And I'm going to show you one slide. Um, so this is regression, so that's all similar. Funding quantity, this is uh, somewhat mixed results. And uh, we're looking at what's the percentage of loan listings that didn't get funded. Uh, because most of the loan listed are already funded. Uh, for the pre week 100% of them are funded. For the post weeks, uh, there's a increase. It's up to interpretation, whether increase substantial or not, it's not 100% anymore. So that can have psychological uh, influence on, invest, on, on, on borrowers because not all loans can be funded on the platform anymore. So to show you really quickly the most recent event of Lending Club, Lending Club closed its second market last month on August 28th. And what we find is we have results for the first two weeks. We're still working on the third week. Uh, so as you can see, the funding time of Lending Club loans in the primary market increased substantially. The mean increases by 32 hours for the first week, by 41 hours for the second week. Uh, that's the case for both the top and middle grade loans. They don't have the bottom grade loans anymore. And mostly they have three-year loans. They have very few five-year loans. So we do, uh, we are working on the second event right now. So that seems to be promising at this point. To conclude, so what we do is we develop a very stylized model of uh, primary market with and without secondary market. And we predict that once the secondary market is closed, there's going to be high uh, effective spread and lower issuance. And we're working on extension to predict a longer funding time in the primary market. Uh, empirical evidence support our predictions in all three dimensions. Uh, the funding time results are more substantial and robust. So we find longer funding time for loans uh, by individual and in, uh, institutional investors uh, for Prosper, uh, higher uh, cost and uh, lower percentage got fully funded. And we find the opposite uh, results for Lending Club, the main competitor. Thank you. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, June. Uh, uh, that was just on time. Uh, so the discussion for this paper is Augustino from Columbia University. Perfect. Um, is it possible to visualize my slides? Yes, I don't see your slides listed here. Yeah. Um, just a second. I sent it uh, early this morning. Kathy, is it possible that we get the slides, uh, his slides on available? They are opening right now. Stand by. All right. Thanks. So while we have this moment, uh, uh, please feel free to uh, add questions or, or comments in the Q&A session. And, we will uh, come back to them uh, well, at the end for the public Q&A. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, perfect. Yeah, just want to ask if I want to control the slides um, directly, uh, is there a way to do that? Yes, the, the panel on the left of the slides, you should see buttons and that should allow you to control the slides. Okay, on the left, huh? Yeah. I assume it's like, it's like a floating <coughs> vertical chart. Right. Right. right, I see the thumbnail view and all the other notation and so on. And there's a number there, you can click on the number. Okay. And that, that, that will move it. Okay, okay. Yeah. perfect. Thank you all. Yeah.
Okay, so thanks uh, for like uh, uh, inviting me to discuss this paper. I mean, I enjoyed a lot reading it, and I will try to provide some uh, yeah, perspectives and also yeah, summarize the, the findings and provide a, like an, I mean, a brief overview of peer to peer lending. I think June already did a good job at describing the main points. So let me start with uh, a first uh, description about the peer to peer lending market. Uh, so just want to mention that this is like a market that uh, is becoming more and more important. Uh, it's like emerging as uh, an important source of financing, especially for like uh, smaller consumers. Uh, it has like clear advantage over like the traditional more, I mean, traditional banking systems where you use uh, these bricker and mortar branches. Uh, and uh, the advantages are clear in terms of cost, in terms of like uh, higher scalability of the systems. And also like the fact that they can reach out to a larger uh, fraction uh, of the market, uh, segment of the market, especially. And uh, typically they are like more loosely regulated uh, compared to the traditional uh, bank financing um, intermediary, uh, bank intermediary system. And uh, in fact, they can also reach out to like parts of the market that typically would be not uh, be served by traditional businesses. So especially like the smaller, for instance, consumer loans and so on. Uh, and typically they have uh, returns that are very attractive, uh, especially I would say during the periods where like we see low interest rates, for example, like during the current pandemic. And uh, the market has been evolving quite fast. In fact, it was uh, probably non-existent or it was very, deep, very small in 2005. And uh, it became like, very large already in 2015, uh, reaching 124 billion. June also has, pro has provided some estimates about how the market is growing. And yeah, I'm just looking at me, yeah, I just looking it up out of curiosity. Yesterday, and I found that basically it's projected to grow at the rate of 48% every year uh, from 2016 to 2024. So this means that uh, if things continue as expected, we will reach out uh, a market size which is substantially large, uh, like on the order of nine. $900 billion in 2024. And uh, the, how, the, how does the market work? So this is just a brief description about the mechanics. Uh, originally, it was intended and organized like uh, an online auction, for example, pretty much like uh, what we see for eBay, like where you have consumer loans, where buyer and seller like beat, uh, and then uh, like the winner of the auctions get to purchased product. But uh, different from eBay, uh, these have evolved uh, to become very central in uh, like lending decisions. And in fact, as of today, it's not just uh, an open marketplace where you see like uh, players such as borrowers and lenders that are transacting with each other, but really the platform has a very important role. For example, if I and a borrower and they want to fund, uh, fund a specific activity, so I apply for a loan, the platform has a lot of control about what is going to happen. In fact, it's the platform to decide whether or not this loan should be funded or maybe it should not be uh, funded, it should be screened. Uh, it also has the role of transferring money of the investors that are uh, funding the loan uh, to the platform. And uh, they also have control about the interest rate that will be charged uh, on the borrower. In fact, like there is a lot of discrimination, a lot of like important screening that has to be performed because depending depending on the credit quality of the borrower, the interest rate should be uh, chosen according. Or similar to what happens uh, in, in the banking uh, system, where if you have a borrower, a, a riskier credit, a riskier borrower, you want to charge a larger interest rate. And at the moment, they are essentially replacing slowly uh, the traditional officers of loan, uh, pretty much in uh, all the roles, because they, they basically take care of all the different activities in, from the, starting from the origination of the loan till when the loan is funded, except for providing the funds finally to the to the buyer. Okay, and. Uh, May I, now let me discuss what this paper does. Uh, basically, the my yeah my impression is that they provide both a theoretical and a model and also an empirical analysis regarding the impact of the secondary market on the liquidity of the primary market. 
And I mean, June has also mentioned like River does more than that. In fact, they also look at spillover effects. For example, if you close the secondary market for uh, an important uh, peer to be lending platform, and what does the impact on the on the on the competitors? Or if you close Prosper, what's the impact on uh, club lending? Uh, but I believe the first piece about the impact of liquidity is really what is emphasized uh, more in the in the present version of the paper that I have read. And uh, the focus is on three important dimensions of liquidity, uh, and uh, these are, I mean, June has already described all of them in detail, so I basically want to summarize that these are the cost, uh, the issuance, and the speed. So the cost is basically defined in terms of the effective spread, so what's the premium that uh, I should charge uh, as an investor if, uh, I mean, if I want to make um, the transaction, because typically if I'm bearing a larger risk, then I want to charge a larger premium because I want to be compensated for bearing this risk. And uh, the issuance is basically the number of quantities of the security that are being issued, and the speed is how long it takes for the loan to, be, to get funded. So if we have that uh, costs are low, issuance is large and speed is fast, it means that essentially we have high liquidity. So these are all different proxies of liquidity. And um, I mean, importantly, I think an important dimension in my opinion of liquidity that is typically understudied in many papers is the speed dimension. So the time dimension of liquidity, because we always think about, okay, bit of spread, but I think what is more important in my view is also how long it takes before you can find uh, a loan, I mean, before you can execute a specific transaction in general. That's at the paper that I, uh, aims at doing that. Uh, uh, in, the, in the current version of the, the paper, they basically use uh, or building build on a very well known model of inventory, like by Grossman and Miller, that has become also like very prominent model in market microstructures. So the, the others are using it in the counter, in the context of peer to peer lending. And in their model, basically, there is an issuer and an investor, and they look at two different variations of this model. In one variation, they account for the presence of a secondary market. In the other variation, they don't uh, account for the secondary market. So what happens, basically, there are three periods. In the first period, we have a risky security that is issued. Then in the second period, we have that the investor gets a liquidity shock. So now, if the investor can use the secondary market, then he will be able to get rid of excess holdings of this security, or he can rebalance, essentially, his portfolio. He kind of load this risk into the secondary market. If, however, the secondary market is not present, then they will not be able to do anything. So they will basically have to wait until the end, which is day three, where, when the payoffs are realized. So that's in a nutshell what the, what the, the paper does in theory. And then they mean, and the, in the theoretical part, uh, the focus is mostly on the first two dimensions of liquidity, cost, and issuance. The other sorts of mention a little bit or speculate about what will be the implications on the time dimensional liquidity, which, uh, which means fair because we, I think you acknowledge the fact that if you want to look at the time dimension, you should look at more continuous time version of this model, which I mean, which might not be easy to solve. And uh, in terms of empirics, uh, they have access to two important data sets, basically the largest uh, US peer-to-be -peer platforms, uh, which are Prosper Marketplace and Lending Club. And uh, I mean, and then they have uh, an interesting uh, scenario because essentially they can really see what happened after the closure of a secondary market, which is an event that indeed occurred on October 28, 2016. And then they measure empirically these measures that I mentioned before about cost, quantity, and execution speed, and they find some proxy for these quantities. So, for example, for the cost, they which is like this, this effective spread, the spread at which um, the loan is um, yes, so, sold is the origination fee. And this origination fee is essentially the difference between the selling price of the, I mean, the, the price at which the loan is sold minus the, I mean, the price at which the lender sells the loan minus the price of, at which the, the borrower would like to buy the loan. So that's essentially measure of the spread between those two. And uh, they also look at the quantity that are being issued, which are defined as the percentage of unfunded loans. So these are essentially the loans that are um, not that have been listed for more than 40 days, uh, 14 days, and that they have not been funded. So these are essentially uh, removed because they don't need, there is no, as far as I understand, there is no role for partial funding. Either the loan is fully funded or not. 
And then the low cost of this execution speed, which is the number of hours uh, elapsing from the time where the loan is first listed till the end uh, when the loan is finally found. So this proxy is basically the speed I mentioned on the that I mentioned earlier. And uh, what are the main findings? I mean, these are empirical findings, but basically the same findings are also what, they, what, what the radical model reproduces. They find that uh, both the mean and the median funding time is strictly higher after closure after you close the, um, the secondary market. Uh, similarly, after you close uh, first the secondary market, especially I mean, already after the first week, you observe that there is an increase in the origination fee, uh, both for the mean and the median. And third, they look at the uh, percentage of expired loans, and they notice that they increase in the first week after closure from 10, from zero to four. So before basically closure, all loans were funded. Uh, after closures, you have that 0.4% of these loans expire without getting funded. And uh, they, I mean, they also say in the paper that basically this has important implications for borrowing decisions, uh, for the decision of borrowers. Although I didn't see a lot of, I would ever like to see a little bit more explanation about in what sense uh, or how you capture in the model the implications that this has on the borrowing decisions. Christina, and, uh, you have about a minute left. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I will try to speed up. Okay, so I want to, yeah, basically I want to bring up some points uh, that, I mean, the paper currently does not uh, address, and I don't know how likely, I mean, how, how, at least I think I would like to see them mentioned. I think it would be helpful to mention, I think also central points that uh, we have in this uh, paper is that uh, the, the, I mean, in general, in the peer-to-peer -peer lending literature, is that there is a lot of discussion about moral hazard. So this moral hazard problem for intermediary is very important in the discussions of delegated loan adjudicator. For example, the paper by Diamond is like an example, a prominent like uh, pioneering paper in this respect. And uh, I mean, if we look at peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms, typically they actually have uh, they are very different from banks because they have little or no stake in all the loans that they are helping to originate. So basically, the investors are relying on the expertise of intermediary for the loan evaluation. And as a result, the peer to peer lending uh, platform may really have a tendency to get as, mo as much as possible in terms of loan origination. And to do so, they will be basically tempted to relax lending standards. So they will basically be lending and expose a lot of credit risk because they are lending at a very, very risky borrowers. So this moral hazard, of course, is an important characteristic. And uh, I, mean, I was wondering whether some of the results, for example, the quantities that are being issued uh, in the, that is one of the dimensional reviews that you consider might have a relation with respect to the moral hazard because you argue that uh, essentially the quantities that are being issued uh, when you have uh, a closure of the secondary market, they will be lower. And the reason is that essentially the investors will have less edging opportunities because the risk bearing capacity of the market is lower. So if you want to offload this risk, you will not be able to do that because the secondary market is not there. And I was thinking whether like in the case where you have, uh, I mean, the, the absence um, means of moral hazard in the secondary market, because if you close the market, of course, you cannot have moral hazard there. Can it increase moral hazard in the primary market, which basically means that it would somehow act as a counteracting force and increase now the quantities that are being issued. And I don't know to what extent it's possible to disentangle these two effects. The final point that I wanted to mention, which I think is my most main concern, is basically whether or not one can do anything to specialize this theory. I mean, especially the, the empiric part is great. I mean, I like the analysis a lot. But in terms of theory, can one say something about uh, peer to peer lending market. For example, you, I think you also admitted in the paper that the model is general. You could apply essentially to any market where you have primary and secondary uh, channels. For example, I, I could think of this model being applicable to corporate bond, also to the mortgage market, where there is always this play between primary and secondary. But I think what might be unique to this peer to peer lending market is this speed and technology. And this speed and technology is essentially the fact that, uh, as many, I mean, many papers have also argued. Basically, the, 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 the availability of this technology basically gives a very important role to the time dimension of liquidity, which is, I think, what you plan to explore. And this could be actually a good, I mean, a unique feature of the peer to peer lending market relative to the others. And uh, I mean, the final so, point. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. So, um, let, let, uh, just in the interest of time, uh, can we 
first go into the presentation and in the Q&A, I think there might be more opportunities for, for you to comment on it. Thank yeah. you for the discussion. Uh, let, let's move on to the second paper uh, uh, titled Vertically Disintegrated Platforms. Uh, Tarek, uh, you have the floor. So let me just switch up the slides so that you have control. Let me test it. Okay, good. Can you hear me? Can you, can you hear me, Michael? Yeah, okay, good. All right. Um, well, hello, everyone, and thank you very much. I'm very happy to present this uh, joint work with uh, Christophe Eymans and Mathias de Watrepon. Again, many thanks to the organizers for including our paper in this, I think, very exciting program. So basically, the idea of this paper is to study if and how distributed ledger technology can improve user welfare in digital payment platforms. So the motivation stems from something that has become obvious for everyone, that is, over the past decades, payment platforms have become paramount to the organizations of our digital economy. However, a number of studies are highlighting the existence of several barriers to the full adoption of digital mediums of payment, and I think this directly echoes the, the panel that we just had before. This is just an example here um, from a study by Lee Matthews and Wang that was published last year in GME, which documents the slow rate of payment card adoption in the US historically. And in particular, this becomes more prevalent as you look down the income line. And based off of this and the theoretical model, the authors further identify two major barriers to the widespread adoption of digital payments. On the one hand, platform market power, and on the other hand, deterring costs borne by specific types of users. In fact, if you start considering application, direct applications like credit card payment platforms, you directly see, so this is an example for Europe, that in the European market, Visa and MasterCard control over 90% of the market. And then on top of this, these platforms typically exhibit asymmetric pricing schemes. So they tend to underprice the consumer side at the expense of the merchants. Now, the economic forces behind these type of dynamics have been studied um, for a while, and there's in particular a couple of very early models uh, built by Jean-Charles Rochet and Jean Tirole in the early 2000s, which show that payment systems typically have these two specific features. First, they are subject to larger network effects, which lead to natural monopoly condition, and this simply comes from the fact that the value of the platform is derived by the amount of people that are actually on it. And the second thing is that these platforms display asymmetric price structure. And the idea there is that one side of the trade typically will pay more than the other because doing so efficiently exploits differences in demand elasticities of the different sides. Now, given these uh, barriers all over the world, governments have had to intervene to limit abuses of uh, platforms having these high um, market powers. Examples of intervention you know, range from setting caps on fees charged by the platforms to promoting adoption by for forcing acceptance from some specific types of users. But overall, the debate remains open, as we've seen again in the panel, as to which policy is the best fix to increase user welfare and adoption in payment platforms. Some of the latest decisions actually have gone in favor of the platforms, like the recent Supreme Court decision to side with American Express in a case of market power abuse. So basically, this is the major context in which we try to contribute by considering the impact of distributed ledger technology, like blockchain, and the innovative economic design brought by cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. In fact, a key opportunity brought by distributed ledger technology is the capacity to allow groups of agents to coordinate on a common state of the world without the need of an intermediary setting prices. So if you take the example of, of Bitcoin, when someone submits a transaction on Bitcoin, the processing of the transactions is done through a network of agents who compete to produce the service, and the pricing of the service is not in the hand of one single entity. This specific type of, of economic innovation has brought scholars like Christian Catalini and uh, his colleague Catherine Tucker from IT to suggest that, in theory, blockchain technology can be used to overcome coordination challenges that otherwise lead network effects to be a source of market power. And that directly comes in line with what uh, Christian mentioned when he talks about the cost of networking. And in the end, the same reasoning lies, as we've seen, behind the idea of um, the promises from the Facebook Libra project to offer cheaper payment services and improve financial inclusions through the adoption of this distributed ledger technology and the promotion of competition. Now, all these promises have also sparked the interest of central bankers, as we've also seen 
uh, previously who are getting more and more involved with the technology and its impact on the, its impact on the economy. So here is now almost outdated quote from Christine Lagarde. It's from the beginning of the year where she said, innovation in the area of payments is racing ahead in response to urgent demand for quicker and cheaper payments. The ECB wants to play an active role in this field of cryptocurrency rather than just acting as an observer. So within this whole context, basically what we want to do with this paper is to test the proposition brought forward by Catalina and Tucker and see whether in effect distributed ledger technology can can address market power issues and improve user welfare. So the way we proceed is by proposing to formalize this new model of platform government, governance as a vertical disintegration. So if you think about traditional platforms like payment system, Visa, MasterCard, et cetera, they create value by allowing buyers and sellers to transact. However, the entire infrastructure is typically owned by the platform and the provisioning of the service is built in-house and the platform maintains full control over prices. In contrast, if you think about you know, the architecture behind Bitcoin, Bitcoin doesn't own the infrastructure. The provisioning of the service is provided by a market of processors who compete to process the transactions between the buyers and sellers. The price, the price is now determined by a market clearing mechanism between processors and the set of users. And so the question we're after is, what are the welfare implications of this vertical disintegration? And in particular, for the case of payment, what specific types of de designs should be implemented in order to maximize welfare and adoption and end up with a better situation than the one we have today? So the way we proceed here is simply by comparing an integrated platform model, which we refer to as a VIP, vertically integrated platform, and a disintegrated version of it, which we refer to as a VDP, vertically disintegrated platform. So the model we construct is uh, shamefully simple. It's a simple extension of the classic two-sided platform model of Rocher and Tirol, where we introduce a market for processing users' transactions. So we have users, as usual. We have buyers and sellers who extract utility from interacting on the platform, typically buying and selling to one another. They also have to pay a transaction fee that is specific to their types. So buyers are going to pay AB per transaction and sellers are going to pay AS per transaction. The new agent class we introduce in the model is those processors who make profit by processing transactions. For each transaction they process, they earn a share, one minus T, of the aggregate fee P, which is the sum of AB and AS, where T is a tax set by the platform. Their cost CI of processing the transactions is driven by processing technology, which is drawn from a non-distribution. And finally, we have the platform, which allows interactions between buyers, sellers, and processors, and generate revenues, revenue by charging a tax on each transaction. The platform maximizes profit via two variables, the tax charge on the transaction and the split of transaction fees between buyers and sellers. So here, Z is going to indicate the price structure. It determines how much one side may be overcharged in order to subsidize participation of the other side. And the profit of the platform is then determined by a total revenue and the fixed cost of establishing and maintaining the platform. At the market level, our measure of welfare um, will be driven by the total participation from users, so NB and, A and S here. And the market clearing mechanism is the aggregate price P that satisfies the total demand from all the users and the supply from processors. And our analysis will consist of comparing this model with its integrated counterpart, which ends up being very close to the original Roche and Tirol model. So here, buyers and sellers are exactly the same as before. Processors do not exist anymore. We basically assume here that the platform integrates the full technology infrastructure that was previously distributed among the processors. So the cost distribution is similar, but now the platform has full knowledge over it. The platform can then therefore fully control prices level P and the price structure Z. The platform collects all the revenue from transaction fees and similar to before, it faces an additional cost C. However, here, and I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on that later on, in contrast to the disintegrated case, we will consider a case where this cost can be affected by the total volume of transactions. Now, at the market level, we do not have a market clearing mechanism anymore, and all the pricing is determined by the platform. All right, so let me now move on to the results. So our plan for the result is basically to compare two cases of monopoly platforms. So we take an extreme view, and we say, okay, let's imagine an economy where we only have one single VIP and another economy where we only have one single VDP. We do so to maximize users' benefit from the network effects, and as such, we focus on 
focus only on the welfare applications of disintegration in the extreme case of zero platform competition. So the plan for the result is as follows. We start by studying the effects of disintegration on price structure, and then we run the welfare analysis by proceeding incrementally. We start with a very simple setting with extreme assumptions, and then we progressively and relax those assumptions. So for the first result, well, basically the price structure strategy of multi-sided platform has been widely analyzed. The major result there is that whenever different sides exhibit different elasticities of demand, it becomes efficient for the platform to charge each side differently. So in our case, recall that the VIP maximizes profit by setting the price structure Z and the price level P, whereas the VDP only has control over Z, and the price level P is set by the market for processors. Now, our first result, however, is going to be that given the same price level P, both platforms achieve the same price structure Z. This result um, simply from the fact that in the VDP, the supply from processors is independent from the price structure Z. And so the platform can always increase its profit by raising the level of demand at any price level. Both platforms end up converging to the same price structure that maximizes demand. Now, while this result is, is simple, we believe it's valuable for two reasons. First, it allows us to focus the rest of the welfare analysis on the price level P, now that we know that both models achieve the same price structure. Second, it shows that previous results on multi-sided platforms directly apply to the analysis of disintegrated platforms. So, the, for example, the adapted learner formula, which determines efficient pricing for multiple sites, hold in a, holds in the case of VDP. This allows us, or at least this will allow us, to have a welfare judgment on the precise design of current VDP application that will be part of um, the next section. So we can move now to our first welfare results. So in this case, we make two strong assumptions. We start by assuming that both the VDP and the VIP have the same cost structure. And we also assume that the, the tax is exogenous for the VDP. In this case, what we find is that under the VDP, that welfare will dominate under the VDP. If the tax that is set by the VDP is lower than a benchmark tax TI. And so this benchmark tax TI is obtained from the following analysis. So the first thing to note here is that the tax charged by the platform will influence total supply. So lower tax will increase the supply curve. Hence, for any given price that is set by the VIP, let's call it PI, we can always find the tax TI that the VDP should set in order to replicate the price of the VIP PI. So once we have this TI, we know that any tax that the VDP is going to set that is lower than this TI will yield higher supply, thereby lowering prices and so uh, resulting in higher welfare. So that's the intuition behind this result. Now, the next thing we do is we endogenize this tax and we let the VDP to choose the tax that maximizes its profit. What we find in this case is that welfare becomes lower compared to the VA. Now, the reason for this stems from the information disadvantage of this integration, right? So the VDP, in his case, it does not observe uh, marginal costs from the processors. And because of the linear price structure of the tax, it cannot extract all the surplus from the processors. In contrast, because the VIP owns the technology, it can fully observe these costs and efficiently appropriate all the surplus. As a result, the VDP will need to compensate by imposing a tax that is higher than the benchmark TI, which, you know, recall, replicates the, the VIP's uh, price, thereby reducing welfare under the VDP. Now, armed with these two results, we can formulate a policy recommendation derived from the following corollary, which simply says that if there is an upper limit set to the taxing capacity of the VDP, such that taxes charged on processors cannot be higher than TI, then we know that welfare under this regulated VDP will always dominate the VIP outcome. And so in the end, the intuition here stems from the fact that the VDP in the end acts as a monopsonist in the market for processors. And hence this result is very much related to the minimum wage intervention type of result that we have in the labor market. So the last result that I want to mention today is uh, this one where we basically now uh, flip the last uh, assumption and we allow the cost structure of the integrated platform, the VIP, to be a function of the total transaction volume. And so once you do that, not surprisingly, you find that if the growth becomes too significant for this cost, 
welfare under the PP will start dominating it will start dominating uh, dominating again even without any intervention on, on its taxing capacity. And so this result is simply driven by the fact that as cost increases, the VIP will reduce demand by increasing prices. This will effectively increase the benchmark tax TI, which will become larger in the endogenous tax that is set by the VDP. Why will it become larger? It's simply because the endogenous tax that is set by the VDP remains constant because all changes in demand are absorbed by the processors by virtue of these, mar these competitive market processors and by virtue of the concept of disintegration here. Right, so why, why do we um, uh, go so far as to play around with the cost structure? It's basically inspired by uh, some uh, re real world cases. So the reason why we studied this extension is because of the existing distinction that exists between different business platform models, and in particular, the difference between closed loop systems and open loop systems. Open loop systems like um, Visa and MasterCard partially rely on the infrastructure of the banking system Accounts are handled by the banks and not by the network, which mainly consists of passing messages between bank accounts. Such architecture is known to be kept in light. And so basically, among all the results that I presented, you can associate the three first welfare results to such case of architecture where the cost structure can be similar between a VIP and a VDP, um, where when the VIP is an open loop system. In contrast, once we look at closed loop system, the company owns the full infrastructure and all the accounts associated with each participant. So here you can typically think of American Express. This business model is much more capital heavy, in particular costs associated with adapting to the demand are directly borne by the platform. And so it is in this later case that the last result that we've obtained becomes relevant. All right. So Armed with this uh, framework and results, uh, we can start deriving welfare implications and recommendations looking at current applications. So we start by looking at, um, you know, the famous Bitcoin and Ethereum applications, which represent in the end the main current form of disintegrated platform application using blockchain technology. And so maybe one thing that I need to mention here is that our coach is interested in the design choices of the payment platform, so we abstract completely from the token aspect of this platform. And in the end, maybe our approach is closer and more suited to stable coins analysis and payments platform analysis based off of TLT. Now, from our perspective, this platform can be seen as zero tax platforms. Nothing, nothing is charged on the processors by the platform and no revenue is derived from transactions either. According to the platform, I mean. So according to our results, low taxes or no taxes are a good thing for wealth. However, these platforms, Bitcoin and Ethereum, have a very precise structure design, price structure design, which basically makes the buyer pay the full transaction fee. So in our model, this would correspond to a, a Z equal to P over two. And in the end, if you are in a heterogeneous system where you have different types of profiles and you are in a multi-sided platform type of setting, this design fails to capture efficiently all the opportunities driven by the heterogeneities in terms of uh, demand elasticity. So by virtue of our result on price structure and the whole literature on multi-sided platforms, we know that platform increase welfare by setting the price structure according to elasticities of demand from both buyers and sellers. And so here as a result, we can safely say, or maybe bet, that Bitcoin and Ethereum design fails to account for the multi-sidedness of payments which may ultimately harm welfare and constitute a major barrier for global ad adoption, in particular if you think about retail payment. All right, so a, a last uh, discussion that I would like to push here is, um, we believe that our results can also inform the current debate over central bank digital currencies and central bank digital payments. According to our framework, uh, CBDC that would be supported by a regulated VDP governance model would be welfare maximizing because it would both ensure the capability to adjust the price structure efficiently, but also to limit the tax level charge on the processors. So in our view, this would be better than a VIP model. Such a solution would also allow governments to implement those central bank digital uh, money and platforms without having to bear the traditional enormous investment costs and maintenance effort that come with these closed loop VIP setting type of examples. All right, so um, let me conclude here. Our hope with this paper is to broaden the debate about platforms, in particular about platform market power and consumer welfare and payments. 
What we do here is we study a technologically driven market solution to the issue of market power and presence of network effects. And we frame this as a form of vertically disintegrated platform. And this, in our view, is made possible now more than ever with the introduction of distributed ledger technology. What we find is that the desirability of this integration is determined by, on the one hand, the cost structure faced by the integrated solution, and on the other hand, the market conditions for processors and the taxing capacity of the platform in the disintegrated case. We also find that the price structure result from traditional platform literature also applies in the case of disintegrated platform, which suggests that they be taken into account in future applications. We finally show that our framework can generate simple welfare applications for current applications such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, but it, they, those results that we have here also provide guidelines for regulation and design policy for future platforms, including, we believe, central bank digital currencies. All right, so let me stop here. Thank you very much. I look forward to Michael's discussion and all the following comments. Thank you very much. All right, Tarek, uh, thank you. And uh, just as a reminder, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A uh, to add the questions and we will uh, try to address them best we can in, uh, at the end of, of my discussion. So let me get right into um, this discussion. Uh, standard disclaimer, the views expressed here are mine and not necessarily that of the New York Fed or the Federal Reserve System. So let's start with some uh, basic facts. First of all, uh, we're seeing an ever increasing concentration of financial markets and services. And one of the drivers for this is the fact that we have digital platforms um, used and facilitating various different services. And this ranges from payments, trading, to even banking. And so um, in this type of digital platform, we typically see a vertically integrated design where the platform provides all users a way to interact with each other and importantly retains control over the types of costs associated with using the platform. Now, uh, kind of coincidentally, we have that distributed ledger technology has vastly broadened the potential set of platform design. And in particular, an important feature is the fact that it allows for us to imagine a world where we can embed competitive market forces into a platform. And uh, by doing so, we can have underlying processes depend on a market of third-party intermediaries. Uh, one great example is Bitcoin. Anyone can become a miner in principle and provide the services associated with uh, clearing transactions on the network. And here we have a vertically disintegrated design where the underlying platform's processes are provided by a third party. So at this standpoint, we see why, what's the allure of having a uh, distributed ledger technology as kind of the backbone for dis redesigning platforms. But it's also important for us to take a, a step back and, and critically assess when and why decentralized platforms might be better. And so in this paper, the authors build a model with a vertically disintegrated platform. And what, what we mean by this is a platform and the users uh, where in between we have third-party intermediaries that are actively providing the operational uh, resources in order to uh, facilitate user interactions. Now, uh, relative to the vertical disintegrated platform, an important comparison is the vertically integrated platform. So this is what we typically think of as a platform where the platform is interacting directly with the users to facilitate the interactions between themselves. So the main question that the, this paper uh, is after is to ask, when are users better off with a vertically disintegrated platform? Now, in my view, uh, among the many results, the key result of the paper is that in general, user welfare is worse under disintegration. Now, the authors show that the under disintegration the platform actually worsens welfare relative to an integrated platform, and then shows that actually uh, this can be reversed if we have the proper regulation and if an integrated platform is too costly to implement. 
So in today's talk, uh, I, I want to go through the intuition for the first result in more detail. And then I'm going to discuss and uh, about the second and third result with the remaining time. So it's gonna help us to kind of uh, fix ideas by having a good idea of what the model looks like. We have a single platform, and then we have users who want to interact with each other on the platform. And here we also now have what we call processors. And processors are going to be responsible in a vertically disintegrated platform for actually processing these interactions between these users. So as in any platform, these users are gonna gain more from interacting with each other. And in particular, uh, we're gonna have some variation in terms of how much users gain per interaction in this platform. Now, altogether, the user's payoff from joining this platform is going to be a combination of the number of interactions they can actually get from the platform times the net gain from the interaction. And the net gain is simply the gain in the utility that the user has net of the price they pay for each interaction, which is given by P. Now this P is uh, charged by the processors for facilitating these interactions between the users and the market uh, uh, and at a market price P, which is going to deter be de determined by supply and demand. And so each of these processors are gonna have some set of interactions that they can actually process, and they're gonna keep a fraction of the revenue that they generate by facilitating these interactions. So putting this together, we have uh, that these processors, based on some fixed cost, are going to get some payoff, which is a fraction of the revenue they generate by facilitating these interactions, net of the cost of operation given by some C. So if we put this together, uh, now we need to think about what the platform itself is doing. And so the platform here is decentralized or disintegrated. And all that the platform is doing is choosing tau, which is the, um, the fraction of the revenue it's going to take from the processors. Now, it ends up that the price itself is going to be determined by supply and demand, but the actual profits of the platform that's uh, decentralized is still going to be given by the, the price times the quantity times the fraction tau. And you can see here tau is going to be implicitly determining both the price and the quantity of how much interactions users um, are going to have. So what you should notice from the, here is the fact that the VDP here is acting effectively as a monopoly. It sets tau to reach its maximum profit. So in comparison, let's think about what the VIP or the centralized platform would do. Instead of having these processors, the platform is going to choose the price directly and with uh, and directly use processors internally to, in order to process these transactions. And so if we look at the profit function of the platform that's integrated or centralized, you see that it's the product of the price and the quantity minus the cost associated with running these processors themselves. Now, if we look, rearrange this equation, what we can see is fixing the price itself, the profit of the integrated platform is simply equal to the disintegrated platform's profit plus the profits of the processors. And this is key. So with the profit of the processors, um, this breakdown, the vertically integrated pro, uh, platform internalizes the benefit of, of demand accruing to these processors. And so as a result, it's going to choose a lower price than what would be induced by this disintegrated platform. Now, with a lower price, that also means there's more volume of interactions with equilibrium. And with more volume, that means that user welfare is actually greater under integration. So altogether, what does this mean? This tells us the specific case where platforms that are decentralized actually do a worse job than those that are centralized. And these are exactly when these platforms are private. So with disintegration, we see that competitive markets of third parties really doesn't improve welfare, 
these, instead, these private platforms are choosing policies to the extent that they can that actually worsens total volume used by the platform, platform users. Now, on this backdrop, I want to mention some of the different dimensions that the authors consider in order th that actually reverses this conclusion. So the first thing is the, is the following. Well, you can actually regulate the share that the platform takes for these decentralized platforms. But the follow-up question is then, well, we can do the same thing with a monopoly platform by, by limiting the price. And so actually the same policies that would be effective for a decentralized platform would potentially be effective for a centralized platform as well. Now, a second statement is the fact that uh, integrated platforms may not be scalable. And as a result, they might be very costly to implement. Now, I want to ask uh, one question about whether this is particularly relevant and realistic. Now, Tarek has provided us with some examples where we could ex examine how there might not be scalability. But this kind of presumes that there is some legacy set of assets that other types of intermediaries can use that allows them to leverage and be, uh, provide the, the processes at a lower cost. Now, in contrast, I think and I tend to believe that integrated platforms and legacy platforms uh, are, have better, and better access to legacy technology. And in fact, we see that even though in principle, Bitcoin was designed for anyone to become a miner, we see the prevalence of new types of uh, processors it designed specifically to be efficient on Bitcoin's network. Now, this, uh, this uh, kind of leads us to believe that maybe the scalability issue is potentially even more skewed towards an integrated platform rather than a non-integrated platform. And I think there we think, need to think more carefully about whether this is the true uh, reason why we think decentralized platforms uh, can potentially improve welfare. So let me just conclude, uh, the authors uh, tackle a very policy relevant problem on platform design and regulation. And I think they have kind of tackled an important question that has not been addressed in the literature before. In particular, they show a clear result on the limitation of decentralization and offer some ideas for how decentralization can also be better. Now, um, at the same time, I think a big question that's not fully addressed is, where do the true gains from disintegration or decentralization lie? And I think this uh, is a fruitful area for further research. All right, so uh, that's um, all that I have. Um, I want to uh, allow for the uh, presenters to uh, first uh, respond maybe to the discussion. And then we have a few questions and maybe we can, uh, with the remaining time, address them. So, June, do you want to start by uh, sure. uh, maybe respond? Yeah, thank you so much, Agustino, for um, for presenting my paper better than I do and for giving us very insightful uh, comments. I am going to respond to a few of points you mentioned. Uh, first of all, I think we should highlight funding speed is important, uh, especially in this market. So I write um, some discussions for Alibaba. That's one of the largest uh, tech company in China. And their consumer loan business has the slogan of 310. Three is three minutes application, one is one second approval, zero is zero second it takes to transfer the fund after a loan is approved. So that's kind of the speed. I don't think we're heading there, but that's kind of the direction in this market. The speed is very, very important. So that's kind of one thing we, we haven't done the highlight uh, enough. The second thing is the borrower's decision. So we are silent on the borrower's decision. So we are essentially modeling uh, the investor decision in the model. Of uh, the, the suggestion we should do more with the funding time in the model, that's one thing we're doing right now. Thank you for that. I think we cannot avoid going through the pain. For uh, borrowers, they have the mirror image. So the borrowers, it's still the same uh, three dimensions. They want a faster funding time. So they want the loan, they want that quicker. They want to have a higher funding probability because they need the money and they want to have a lower funding cost. So that funding cost is origination fee plus what the lenders are charging them. So these are the three dimensions the borrowers are considering. So for example, if you don't have the secondary market, the primary market equity is drying up, that's bad for borrowers because the cost is gonna go up. And the other two dimensions is worsened as well. I think we, 
we could discuss that in the paper. So far, we didn't really highlight that. For um, moral hazard platforms, that could be a huge issue in a slightly different context. So right here, Prosper and Learning Cloud, both of them have been in existence for more than 10 years. One of them is uh, 15 years. I, I give the country example in China at the at the peak there were 6,000 uh, platforms on peer to peer lending and um, the majority of them collapsed. Some of those are Ponzi schemes. Others just didn't have good um, good business models. So essentially, the moral hazard issue on the platform can be very severe. So in the U.S. market, even though they are not highly regulated, uh, they are they are behaving better than the more freely entering um, and no regulation uh, Chinese market. So here I'm thinking uh, there could be moral hazard, uh, which we didn't model at this point. One thing is, for example, Prosper Market, this is the platform they found uh, the primary issuance. They, they do the primary issues, but they have a separate entity called uh, Prosper Funding LLC. So that's a separate entity that service these loans. So if a prosper market went down. So if the prosper market goes into bankruptcy, that prosper funding LLC is a separate legal entity. So with original fee, uh, which can be as high as 5%, part of that goes into this prosper funding LLC that can to some extent mitigate uh, the moral hazard, but that cannot get rid of the moral hazard. Another thing is um, the moral hazard, I would think is working in the same direction. I think you hint on that as well because without the second market, investors have to hold the loan till maturity, right? Five years is a very long time to hold the loan, especially if you don't trust the market. So that would make our predictions sharper uh, with additional layer of conflict, which is the platform's problem if they don't do the right screening. So I think that's one discussion we can have. I'm not sure whether we can put that into the model. So I can discuss with my co-authors uh, on that. Um, uh, there, there are two questions from both some um, from um, the audience. Should I answer that or should I wait? Yeah, so let, why don't I read the question and then if you can yes. limit your answer to uh, very shortly to maybe a minute, um, that would sure. be great. Yes. So yes. the question is, could there have been other spillover effects in the background, such as the changes in securitization activities of other online lenders? And how about uh, uh, Fed fund rate hikes, which could have discouraged the demand for variable rate loans? All right, so really quickly, that's two questions. First of all, the two lenders there, Prosper and Lending Club, they are the closely related ones. Others, for example, Cabbage, that's for small business mostly. Sophie is for social network lending, started with Stanford uh, alumni. So those are different kind of loans. So in the background, they probably have other activities, uh, but these two are closely uh, related ones. Federal fund rate, we haven't controlled for. So for sure, we can do that as a robustness test. Uh, thank you for that suggestion. We did control for the corporate loan, AAA, the, the yield between that and the treasury five-year yield. And we also control for the uh, C corporate loan and federal um, uh, yield, uh, federal uh, treasury bill yield. So that's kind of where we're controlling for, for, for the underlying uh, interest rate change. Uh, and one thing I want to highlight is because if there's anything, say, an increase of a federal fund rate from 0.29% to 0.4%, that did happen, that would, um, to some extent, affect the two platforms in the same direction. So we're showing that they're going into different directions. That's probably more likely due to the closure of the second market of Prosper. Thank you. Great. And, and Tarek, uh, can you uh, take a, a moment to respond, maybe? <laughs> Yeah, sure. So thank you very much, Michael, for this very uh, over and very simplified, you know, overview of, of the I don't say, overview of, of the model and the results. Um, I think um, the, the major thing that I would like to address in your in your comments um, is that indeed um, in, in, in the in the modeling as you as, as you as you as you replicated it, um, as soon as we abstract away from the cost structure. The main conclusion of our paper is that this integration indeed um, is not a straightforward, that does not bring straightforward benefits to the to the users, in particular if it's not regulated, etc. Um, I, I, and maybe this is this is worth a little bit more time um, and, and effort, and maybe in the paper this is typically something where we should put more effort in. But that's justifying why I, I took this 
the time to take a slide on it, is I do believe that the infrastructural costs that are borne by platform does matter when you want to decide between an integrated solution and a disintegrated solution. I took the examples of, of open loop and closed loop systems. Um, I do believe my experience, let's say, with policymakers is that, especially when we think about central bank digital currencies, the debate about whether the central bank is going to have to implement the whole infrastructure, including the accounts of users or not, does play a role in, in which model they're going to they're going to favor. So, you know, if you look at the price of the investment cost for the European uh, monetary system of handling target two, which is the wholesale payment system between banks, it's huge. And we're not even talking about retail. So I do think that, and this is a fully closed loop integrated VIP type of model. Um, so I, I do think that stability is something that is being taken into, into account in particular when it comes to public investments. And that in this specific case, as, as I pointed out in the end, uh, something like a disintegra disintegrated solution at the at the regular at the let's say at the public utility level may become relevant because then you allow to discharge part of the operational cost of the maintenance cost, etc., and and make it independent or at least least dependent on the demand volumes because this is being absorbed by the processors and the validators that are competing within the market. So. So I'm, I'm, I will double down on the idea that I don't think this uh, dimension can be uh, skipped uh, from the decision of a, of a, of a, of a platform to, to, to build itself. And as an ultimate example, if you compare this cost of Target 2, for example, with the cost it has taken the Bitcoin platform to establish itself from the point of view of the platform, I think we're really talking about orders of magnitudes of difference uh, in terms of cost being borne by in this case, it would be uh, Nakamoto. Fair enough. All right. So, well, thank you so much, everyone, for the presentation and discussions. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll reconvene at 2.15.